Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Heinz. Um, as she mentioned, I am uh, I'm a content manager and senior editor at Wordvice, and we are a global editing company. Uh, I'm very honored to be here speaking with you today at the Transplantation Society of Taiwan. Um, my presentation is going to be quite a bit different than the ones you've seen prior. Um, this isn't going to be about medical uh, techniques or innovations. It's going to be about manuscripts and something you're probably all very familiar with. Specifically, I want to bring your attention uh, to ways in which you as an author of a manuscript can self-edit your work and thereby increase your chance of being published in journals to what you're applying. And I know that publishing in journals is uh, extremely important, especially if you work in academic environments or um, at many uh, professional companies, drug companies, you want to have a higher profile. So in the world of clinical research writing, rejection by journals is not the exception, but the norm. Probably everybody in this room has been rejected at some point from a journal. Um, so it's not something to be ashamed about or lose sleep over. But if we really want to get our work published in a scientific journal, then the question we have to ask is why exactly are our manuscripts being rejected? So one answer that we have to this question is that there is a deficiency in the quality of writing in a great many of the manuscripts that are submitted. So there's thousands of manuscripts submitted to, um, to scientific journals. And while the scientific research is, in many ways, novel, um, provides a contribution, has extreme quality of research, the quality of writing parameter sometimes is lacking. So that's what I want to focus on today. So what exactly do we mean by quality of writing? Um, it's not an equal meaning to quality of research, but rather refers to the way in which the research is presented in the words and the explanation in the manuscript. Um, so we want to divide this today into two categories, and I'll be talking about manuscript content as well as writing and composition. Um, when I talk about manuscript content issues, I mean consistency of material. Is the material consistent? Uh, and logical in its exposition, does the title match the actual topic that you're writing about? Uh, is the abstract up to date with all the findings in the paper? And when we discuss inclusion of appropriate content, it's self-explanatory, but do the introductions, the methods, results, and discussion section all uh, include all of the necessary information? Do they include too much information? So we'll be looking at those. And the second part of my presentation, we'll discuss writing and composition issues. Now this refers to using correct grammar and writing style, uh, effective writing style. And since style affects the readability, the comprehension and engagement with readers of a particular journal, this is extremely important to, to journal editors and publishers for the ultimate goal of the journal is to have it be read by a wide readership. So the whole purpose of this presentation is to give you practical ways to improve the quality of your writing. Um, what I want to convince you is that by acting in the role of researcher, author, and editor, all three of those, uh, manuscript writers can take control when it comes to getting their work published. So to add to this evidence that quality of writing does play a role in our journal acceptance or rejection, um, I want to show you a 2013 study of papers that were submitted to medical journals. Um, and these were papers based in African and Asian countries, uh, some of the journals you may even be familiar with. In this study, there were 42 papers analyzed. And there, they found crucial flaws in every section of the manuscripts. Um, just a few stats from these. Nearly 68% had problems in the introduction and results section, so almost 70%. Introduction and results. 86% had flaws in material and methods section, and 71% in the discussion section. So as you can see, the errors are manifold and various throughout the essay. But what do we mean by flaws? Um, the author gives some details about this in the results. Um, they discuss that there's insufficient background information, inappropriate review of literature, uh, a lack of a clear problem statement and research objectives, an introduction whose lengths were inappropriate, and there's actually quite a bit more. Um, I thought this was particularly interesting, the end of the results here. 
the authors say that a large proportion of the reviewed articles lacked good grammatical writing. So since that's a central issue we're talking about today, I hope you can uh, take it to heart and pay attention to this. Well, a minority lacked scientific validity or originality. So basically that means that regardless of the quality of research, methodology, uh, etc., if the quality of writing wasn't up to snuff, the manuscript was rejected. So there's ample evidence to suggest that this is a serious concern for all researchers who wish to get published, especially in leading journals. Um, and one more uh, excerpt from this is in, in the conclusion section. The authors say that manuscripts had remarkable errors. There is a need for attention to detail in study design, manuscript preparation, and that further training of medical scientists and the techniques for manuscript writing for journal publication is needed. So that is exactly what we're discussing today. So how can manuscript authors be aware of uh, where they are making the mistakes in content? I want you to think about this as a checklist. So this is some common content errors by section, but we won't go into great detail. Just using it as a checklist while you edit and revise your manuscript, um, you can ask yourself whether your paper has any of these deficiencies. So let's just go through each section and uh, we'll give a couple examples for each. So the first is misleading or obscure titles. Um, a title that does not set the limits of the study right at the beginning is a serious error. For example, a basic investigation that uses an animal model might, uh, should mention in its title that the study is an animal study. You might think that's kind of a, an odd example, but as ed an editor, we see this a lot. We see that the title is, is, is way off base. And um, we realize that the, the majority of manuscripts that we edit are from non-native English speakers. And because most of the international journals are uh, written in English, this is a, a disadvantage for non-native speakers. Um, but there are ways that you can correct for this, and we will show you that. Um, the second section is inaccurate abstract. Um, abstracts are written sometimes several months before the paper is written, so there is some, often a discrepancy between the abstract and the content within the manuscript. So if you are uh, about to be submitting your manus manuscript for publication, you should always check the abstract and make sure it's updated with the recently acquired data that you have in the body of your paper. Uh, next section that has errors is the introduction. So the introduction should follow the form of an outline, right? It should give the, uh, contain the study question, hypothesis, and study objectives. Uh, if all of this information is not specified, if the importance of the study is not shown, it's considered a major error. So you want to make sure you have all of the required elements listed in your introduction. Uh, we'll go through these quickly since we're a little short on time today. Careless methods. Um, Sometimes the authors will have the same methods in a previous study as they do for a current study, and they will copy those methods and paste them into their manuscript. And this is actually self-plagiarism, and it's a serious problem. So you want to make sure to write your section every time you have a new manuscript. Um, next section is omitted results. So the results section, as with most, uh, adhere to a word limit. So authors will often leave some information out, either intentionally or uh, unintentionally. For example, not all the study subjects might be accounted for in the study, um, or the names are not provided for uh, for specific analysis. So you need to make sure and write out all your results as well. And last is the discussion section. So there's some uh, many common errors in the, the discussion section. For instance, the flow of ideas is disconnected or not supported. The content is too expansive and wanders from the results. Uh, key results are poorly explained and the study's limitations are not described. So again, I want you to look at this as, as a checklist, um, looking at each section and analyzing it during the editing process. And a good way to do that is not only look at it on your own, but always a good, a good rule of thumb is to always have a peer whether someone working on the study with you or someone in an uh, unrelated field even. So you have an objective view and to make sure that everything is uh, complete in these sections. Um, today we're just going to look at titles and abstract in a little greater detail. 
So I want to drive home this point about the beginning of your manuscript being essential and how you present, how you present and using quality of writing um, as a crucial cr criterion. So Dr. Paul T. Wong assesses um, uh, seven common reasons why submissions are rejected. And he talks about quality of writing being a crucial criteria. So he writes some simple uh, suggestions that you might follow. Simply by, uh, let's see, an editor or reviewer can decide whether a manuscript is good simply by reading the abstract or the first couple paragraphs. Because this is the first chunk of the manuscript that editors and reviewers see, they're going to base their judgment upon the quality of the research and the quality of the writing um, and the importance of the writing based upon these first sections. So he advises that you pay a special attention to the quality of writing in the abstract as well as the first paragraph. And he doesn't mention this explicitly, but we're going to throw in the title. Because the title is the most visible part of the manuscript to researchers, um, to anybody that is looking uh, through a database for a manuscript. So let's start with the title. I want to give you some tips for crafting an appropriate title. And again, this will be in a checklist form. So there's no hard and fast rules. The rule of thumb is to read through the journals that you want to submit to and see what their guidelines are and see uh, what, they, what the sort of um, structure that they follow. So tip number one is keep it short. Uh, avoid filler words like the effects of, a comparison of, a case study of. And this is pretty par for the course in uh, manuscripts. You can see this, uh, these a lot, these terms. The fact is that they're not essential. If they're not essential, if your study has a very long title already, you want to get rid of these because the longer your title, the harder it is to search for. Um, don't use questions or complete sentences in the title. A phrase is often uh, the best way to go. Don't use abbreviations in your title. There are some exceptions to this, such as if you uh, are using a, an acronym that is widely known, uh, interdisciplinary, uh, like such as DNA. Um, but otherwise, don't use two specific uh, abbreviations within the title. Save that for uh, after the abstract. You want to narrow the scope of what is in your paper. So if you have um, a paper that is about the gastrointestinal diseases in 70-year-olds in Seville, Spain, writing a title that reads, Disorders of the Stomach in Elderly Spanish People is too broad, right? It's, it's definitely too broad for uh, what your paper is about. So you need to keep it narrow. But you also want to use keywords that other researchers will use. So the balance of narrowing your scope and using general keywords to have a greater chance of hitting upon your manuscript in the database is the real uh, trick of the title. And one way to do that is to put important terms at the beginning and at the end of your title. So if you have a case study at the beginning, it's less likely to get a hit. If you have the content the real focus of your study at the beginning is easier to see and it's more likely to result in a keyword hit. And last on this list, again, research the journal database. You really need to do your homework before you submit to any publication. Um, Nature is a different ma magazine than psychology, is a different publication than um, medical publications. So you really need to know your readership. You really need to know what the reviewers of the journals are looking for. So you have to really think about this holistically, think about how you're, um, you're presenting your manuscript to the audience that reads those journals. So let's look at some explicit ways how we can revise our title. So here I have written, um, I've actually taken this from, uh, from a publication, but changed it just a little bit. Uh, we have Quite a long title, as you can see. A case study that assesses the impact of program volume and composition on waiting list outcomes in pediatric kidney transplantation. So if you can tell, there's uh, a couple things wrong with this. One is it's really long. And two, it has a lot of extra words we don't need. So the first thing you might do to uh, change this title 
is to eliminate, excuse me, is to eliminate the case study, as we mentioned, that's not the most important. And next, that assesses, right? Because you're referring to the case study, you don't need to talk about um, what it does. So a more straightforward and active looking title would read like this, assessing the impact of program volume, et cetera. So at the beginning you have the physical, uh, a powerful word about what your study is doing and at the end you have the content, the important term, pediatric kidney transplantation. Uh, another example, the associations between bleeding and thrombosis and ventricular assist device therapy, a four year longitudinal study. I want you to look at it for five seconds and see which parts you might trim to make it look nicer and, and leaner. Again, the beginning, the associations between. When you have two ideas, we already assume that there are associations between them. And the structure of the study, the methodology, a four-year longitudinal study, it's interesting information, it's not essential in the title. So we can make it a little bit tighter and write the focus at the beginning, bleeding and thrombosis associated with ventricular assist device therapy. Looks a lot nicer and um, the manuscripts, uh, the journals that you send it to will undoubtedly think so as well. So let's move on to the abstract. Um, the abstract is the pivot point of a paper because many journal editorial boards screen their manuscripts based only on the abstract. Even though you're paying the publisher's money to read your work. These people are human, they have thousands of manuscripts to read, and if the abstract doesn't do it for them, does not tell them what they need, your manuscript might end up in the garbage. And you don't want that, right? So again, let's think about these suggestions as a practical checklist. Uh, number one, completeness. How do you know when you have enough information in your abstract? A simple rule of thumb is to imagine that you are another researcher. You're doing a search um, for a similar study, but it's not the exact same study. You come upon your abstract. You should ask yourself, if, if this abstract was the only part of the paper that you can access, if you don't have a membership to ScribD, um, would you be happy with the amount of information presented here? Does it tell the whole story about your study? If the answer is no, then the abstract needs to be revised, and you need to spend a lot of time on your abstract, of course. Um, whether, the structure, uh, whether the abstract is structured or unstructured is very important. And again, you can find this out by looking at the guidelines of the journal, looking at other manuscripts that that journal has published. Um, if it calls for explicit structure, you certainly want to write that out. Don't overlook, overlook these things. It's a good way to weed out your paper from the field. Um, next, writing style. So you want to, I want to say this with a caveat, use the active voice whenever possible um, per the content of the given journals. I might say this a few more times, per the content of the given journal. Active voice conveys a clearer message of uh, subject and predicate. However, in many journals, in throughout the last 20 or 30 years, the passive voice has sort of been the de rigueur, the, the way to go in manuscripts. This doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to write, but if your journal that you're submitting to tends to use a lot more passive, you might consider using that. But keep in mind that if your entire manuscript is written in a passive voice, it's much harder to read, even for native speakers. It's not as readable and therefore usually not as interesting. Um, you want to, again, write the abstract last, avoid all abbre abbreviations, excessive jargon, or confusing terms. Think about your abstract similarly to the title. You want it to be understood by a wider audience. And last, your abstract should not contain these things. Lengthy background information. If you are doing a study on the bottlenose dolphin in the, the Car Caribbean, you don't want to write about the entire history of the bottlenose dolphin in your abstract. Um, a simple summary, one sentence summary will suffice. You do not want to reference other literature explicitly in your abstract. Um, you do not want to use ellipses or incomplete sentences. 
And this seems obvious, but again, as editors, we see this a lot. And changing the abstract is a bit touchy as an editor because we do not want to change your intended meaning and, and your important content because the abstract is so important. And last, don't use, don't reference uh, visual aids and make reference to them in the abstract. It's simply a waste of time and space. So in 2016, our company, Wordvice, analyzed several million words on the papers we received in the previous year. And we did this to find out exactly where the most errors occurred and to help our clients understand these errors. The more they understand, the easier our job becomes as well. So we broke these down into several categories. Um, we have style at 32%, word choice 22%, and grammar at 21% of the, of the edits we make in, in total. So these are the lion's share of the errors that we see in our manuscripts. And to look further at grammar, which we will be looking at first, um, we found that uh, there's definitely some that are more prevalent than others. Verb forms were 6%. These are a little tricky to analyze. Uh, with, uh, we, there's lots of uh, algorithms that we use, but um, subject verb agreement at 12%, prepositions 12%, and determiners were 62% of the edits that we made. Now, determiners refers to articles, uh, a and the, this, that, really small, seemingly um, not, non important elements in your paper, but when you add them up, they're extremely important and they affect quality of writing tremendously. So, let's discuss three of these uh, top issues that we found, these problems that we found. The first we're going to discuss is verb tense. As you probably all know, the purpose of the verb tense is to indicate the timing or action of a condition's existence. That's the definition of a verb. Surprisingly, many researchers are confused about which tense to use when they describe their research. And I don't blame them. There's specific rules uh, for the different style formatting guides. So you have to be careful of which to use. But here's a quick guide of which tenses you should generally use. Generally speaking, you use the past tense when you're discussing prior research. Dr. Watson asserted that the mice in group B would be blind. So this is a, a prior research, not in this study. You use the past tense when discussing the result or observation made during your study. When you're observing uh, the mice in group B, the mice in group B developed tumors in their parietal lobes. Okay, so these are real, you talk about these as you would a, a real event in life, right? It's your observations. In the present tense, you want to use present tense for general facts, such as the earth revolves around the sun, scientific laws, etc. The subject of a sentence, um, when the subject of a sentence is your paper or your study, our study demonstrates, um, our work focuses on. You want to use present tense when discussing a conclusion or interpretation of current findings. So this is, again, your findings or uh, another's, your speculation. Entropy may be involved in, in this phenomenon. Let's look more closely at some examples. Again, these are past tense, and these are general rules. So here's some examples of using prior research. The Bowen group hypothesized that there would be an increase in air pressure. Many studies have done through throughout the 20th century have confirmed this affinity between carbon and nitrogen. This is not your research, others' research. Observations in your study. We observed that mice in B group who were exposed to radiation developed parietal lobe tumors. Tumor cells in test group C metastasized upon ex uh, exposure to this chemical. So let's look at some present tense uh, examples. General facts. Air pressure decreases with altitude. If you were to use the past tense here, uh, your readership might confuse it with an observation that you made in your study and certainly you're not trying to break uh, a law of physics or examine you know, a general law. So if you're stating a, a fact, air pressure, air pressure decreases with altitude. It's a general fact. The, hu the average human skeleton contains 270 bones at birth. This number decreases to 206 bones in adulthood. Right? Uh, when the subject of your sentence is your work, this study confirms previous findings. Our research indicates that a majority of healthy kidney donors. And notice as a side note here, 
there, this is an active voice, right? To change this, you might write, um, our previous findings were confirmed by this study. This is a lot, takes a lot fewer words, and uh, we'll talk more about that. Interpretation of current findings. Comorbidity appears to be a factor. So these are uh, implications or y your interpretations of what uh, your study is revealing. The results of past studies tend to corroborate this evidence. I could give you a million more examples, but let's move on to article use. Uh, because article use was such a, an enormous component, I don't want to insult you by, uh, by thinking that I'm, I'm assuming you do not understand how to use articles. However, because there's so many mistakes in this section, I want to start by giving you a quiz. <laughs> so, which article should you use? A or N, the indefinite article, the, the definite article, or no article? So I'll give you a couple seconds for each, and you can choose in your mind which one you think should be applied here. We analyzed a mm, variety of tissue samples. I'll let you answer in your mind as well. You don't, you don't have to shout it out. So we analyzed a variety of tissue samples. Experts identified mm, lakes surrounding the compound, compound as a source of mm, infection in question. Answer. Experts identified the lake surrounding the compound as the source of the infections in question. Third, mm, colors affect our perception of reality. We do not need an article for this. You may be wondering if you missed any of these, uh, what the reasons are, and let me tell you. For time purposes, I'm going to skip these next quiz questions and move to this chart, which shows how to use uncountable nouns, how to apply articles to uncountable nouns. Um, a noun is countable if, a, as the word suggests, the noun can be counted. So apples are uh, countable. Uh, chairs are countable. A noun is uncountable if it is not counted, such as liquids, water, uh, or it is broken down into too many parts, sand. So you do not say one water, two water, three waters, four waters simply water. Um, so let's first look at these uncountable. When it comes to uncountable nouns, the articles A and N cannot be used with the nouns. Therefore, the only choice you have is really using the, the, indef or the definite article or no article at all. So let's, when, let's see when you should use the or when you should use no article. So when, any, when you're referring to any of the countable noun, use the noun with no articles. Right? Drinking water has many benefits. Love is a strong emotion. You're referring to uh, any of the noun, right? So you're not referring to th this love or that love or this water. You're talking about all water. Uh, when you're referring to one specific noun in space and time, you will use the. It's a bit confusing. Sometimes you wish English didn't have articles at all. <laughs> so let's look at uh, example one. The water is blue. Well, what's the difference between simply water is blue and the water is blue? We know with this definite, in, uh, definite article, the, that we're referring to a specific water. And perhaps we've referred to it earlier in our study, so we know which water we are pointing to. We examined the water bordering the town. So here you have the same uh, structure, except here you have a, a modifier that shows where it is, a prepositional phrase, bordering the town. Um, let's move on to countable nouns. So countable nouns, you have a bit more options. We must look at whether we are talking generally about the countable noun or about a specific example of the countable noun. Similar rule to uncountable. So let's start with when we are looking at one member of that noun, you use a or a with that noun. This is when you're not referring to any specific member, but any amongst the members, to be abstract about it. Um, maybe your son or daughter has said, Dad, Mom, I want a car. Right? They don't say, I want the car, unless perhaps you, they're a little too spoiled and they can choose whichever car they want. <laughs> they say, I want a car. Right? Want one amongst many for the purposes of driving. Um, let's move down to all members of the noun generally. Use the noun with no articles. Colors can affect our perception. 
If you think, if you look back to the uncountable nouns, drinking water has many benefits. Love is a strong emotion. It's the same principle. It's the same rule, right? But it's pluralized. Colors can affect our emotion because colors is countable. Scientists have been researching this issue for decades. All scientists. We're not talking about specific scientists. Again, if you were to say the scientist, the reader will, will imagine you're referring to a specific group of scientists. The uh, cardi cardiac specialists at this hospital have been researching this issue for decades. Then you would use the definite the, right? Um, last one, the countable noun as a whole group use the. The elephant is a large animal. The harp is a difficult instrument to learn. So you're referring to the entire group that that noun belongs in. So let's move on to the third element of grammar that we will discuss, and that is parallelism. Um, to give you a brief summary of what parallelism is, it's having the same sections of a, a sentence that contains more than one component, having them be the same setup, using the same verb or the same number, and uh, I'll show you what we mean. Uh, but many native speakers as well tend to use parallel, uh, non-parallel structures. And this creates awkward, uh, it's very awkward to read um, in addition to being grammatically wrong. So when we use strings of words, we want to make sure each part has equal value. Okay, so in each of these examples, there is a mistake. And I wonder if you can... Try to guess that mistake in your head. I like apples, oranges, and going to the zoo. Let's just check these first. So the non-parallel part of the sentence is going to the zoo. Because apples and oranges are simply object or ob objective case, right? I like apples. Whereas going to the zoo is a verbal uh, phrase. So you have noun, noun, verbal phrase. So it's not parallel. Um, and number two, the coach advised that I should eat healthily, exercise regularly, and that joining a gym would make this easier. So the non-parallel item is in red here. Why is it non-parallel? Well, you have eat healthily, so you have this uh, verb and adverb combination, exercise regularly, and here you have a, a relative uh, phrase, relative pronoun phrase, that going that joining a gym would make this easier. So it's not, it, it doesn't uh, match with the others. Last, Mary is a celebrated author, dancer, and writes great songs. Uh, here you have the word is, and we see this the most often of any of the um, non-parallel sentences. In my experience, I would say we see this with uh, the linking verb is. Um, Mary is an author, she is a dancer, and she is a, no, she's not a great song. She writes great songs. It's not parallel with the others. So let's talk about how we can fix these phrases. Um, there's a lot, I want to say there's a lot of resources on the internet. It's very obvious, but uh, I would find whichever paradigm, whichever um, resource that, that you can use the most simply and, and which makes sense to you and, uh, and look through your uh, manuscript and apply these rules as, as, as tedious as that is. So uh, method one, you should make the grammatically non-conforming parts match the other parts. So, and here's the non-parallel sentence. The coach advised that I should eat healthily, exercise regularly, and that joining a gym would make this easier. So we're going to just change part three so it matches the other two. The coach advised that I should eat healthily, exercise regularly, and join a gym. So we have eat, exercise, join. It reads better. It's, it's nicer, it makes more sense, and the editor doesn't have to do it for you if you can do it yourself. Okay, method two, make the other parts match the grammatically non-parallel part. So opposite, you have the first two parts um, changing to part three. So I like apples, oranges, and going to the zoo. If you want to make your sentence more active, you would switch it to that verb form. I like eating apples, eating oranges, and going to the zoo. Either one is acceptable. It depends on which component of the phrase you want to focus on. You like the, th the object or you like the action of doing these things. Um, method three, split the sentence. From a reader's perspective, in, in scientific manuscripts, 
often we see sentences that are five or six lines long. <laughs> and as much punctuation as you use, as many commas as you can use, that often makes reading extremely difficult, for, even for the, most, the, the smartest and uh, most well-educated and immersed scientists and reviewers. So splitting the sentence really just makes it shorter and easier to digest. The coach advised that I should eat healthily, exercise regularly, and that joining a gym would make this easier. So let's make it another an, uh, second sentence here. The coach advised that I should eat healthily and exercise regularly, period. He also told me that joining a gym would make this working out easier. You are adding a couple words, but it's, um, it's much easier to, to read, and you can add another element of meaning if you have a second sentence. Um, I'm going to skip this section for the sake of time, but let's look at just some examples. Th there's other ways that your sentence can be non-parallel, and there's uh, ways to fix it, um, dozens of them, so let's just look at a couple. I like the big house built in 1910 and features two great living rooms. That gives me a headache just reading it. I like the big house built in 1910. That features two great living rooms, right? So this is the same thing. Um, part A, the big house, and... The, house, the big house features two great living rooms, so use the relative pronoun, that. I not only like to play the violin, but also dancing, right? Here we have a, just a regular uh, infinitive verb. I not only like to play the violin, but I also like to dance. Or, I, not only, I like to not only play the violin, but also dance. The verb form is the same. I prefer to go on a vacation than a bonus. We're missing the infinitive here, right, in, in the verb. I prefer to go on a vacation than to receive a bonus. Uh, one way you can check for these manually in your manuscript would be to underline all the verbs, uh, all the nouns that you use and make sure that the corresponding, um, if you have a, a longer sentence with, with more than two parts, that they are all parallel. So look at the, each noun um, themselves and the accompanying verbs uh, that go with them. Okay, um, next we're going to talk about writing style. So, in our breakdown of these papers, we found that overwhelmingly the passive voice and wordiness accounted for the majority of style issues. And I want to reiterate what I had said earlier that um, this is not a hard and fast rule to say don't use the passive voice, only use the active. Far from it. And editors have a difficult time discerning when the, the author would like us to use the passive and active. It's simply, um, regardless of how good the editor is, they have to make that call, and it could change your meaning, your intended meaning to some extent. So you want to be able to make that decision for yourself. Um, so regarding the use of active passive voice, it's, it's advisable to, to use the active if you can with an agent. Um, so again, you want to research the journal that you're going to be submitting to. So let's, but with that being said, let's see how style affects your manuscript's readability. So active and passive voice. So here we have a sentence that includes a combination of active, or sorry, a paragraph that includes a combination of active and passive voice sentences. And I think ultimately that is the way to go because then you have a different sentence lengths, you're varying your, your, your style, and that is ultimately making it more readable for your uh, readers as well. So here we have next generation sequencing studies have tremendously advanced our understanding of the genes. In the green we have the active voice. Because you want to, you want to focus on, this is your, your focus uh, content, it's the, your, the next generation sequencing studies are the central part of, of the study. I assume. So start with that and then use the active voice. It really shows the, what the importance of this element is. These efforts have identified core sets of driver genes that are frequently mutated. So here it's, it's clear why we would use uh, the active voice because the efforts are the important element. The efforts have identified core sets of values. But here the genes are frequently mutated. We don't have an agent. We can't say nature mutates the genes. It, it just doesn't make sense. So when we, have, we don't have an agent present to, to give active voice, it's better to use the passive, the passive voice. Genes are mutated. 
Um, cancers were largely resolved. Resolved by whom? We don't have an agent to say it. Dr. Dr. X resolved the cancers, so it's much better to use passive in those instances. Um, let's keep moving on here. So how do you change the passive voice to the active voice? You need to identify the true subject and reorder your sentence to establish the subject, verb, object order. So here we have the speech was given by the mayor. The agent is the mayor, right? So simply put the, the predicate here uh, and switch it with the original subject, the original noun, one. The mayor gave the speech. It reads better, and there's no need for a passive voice in this sort of uh, structure. Okay, so moving on to prepositions. Um, when you're trying to stay within a specific word limit, eliminating grammar constructions with prepositions helps tremendously. It counts down, it counts, um, it, it deletes a lot of the words if you can delete the little prepositions that occur in your manuscripts. So that's the biggest issue with them is they create wordiness. So often stronger and more succinct verbs can replace these phrasal verbs, these ver verbal phrases that incorporate prepositions. So let's see what happens. Um, this sentence, he got to the finish line. Not only is it elementary, got to, you actually have more words. He reached the finish line. It's stronger. And you may at times need a thesaurus for these, depending on your vocabulary level. But um, this is a pretty common verb, so there's no reason why you wouldn't use that stronger verb and replace these two, got to, with reached. It's, it, it's much more professional. He made a decision about what he will do next year. He decided what he will do next year. You only need one verb, right? Okay, here we have uh, the genitive or uh, possessive. The approval of the Food and Drug Administration was received yesterday. Who's your agent? The Food and Drug Administration is the agent. So let's make it active and get rid of the of. The, the Food and Drug Administration's approval was received yesterday. So using that possessive, um, the possessive case is uh, another way to get rid of the, the pronoun. Or, sorry, the preposition. The studies were conducted at Max Laboratories in Chicago. The studies were conducted at Chicago's Max Laboratories. So you've kept the passive tense, uh, the passive voice, but you've eliminated the preposition again. So I want to see if you can look at these and uh, make a suggestion. It might be difficult. There's a few ways to do it, but what do you think? Here's the original. The aim of our research was to assess the correlation between variable A and DNA replication rates. Does anybody want to try for a, <laughs> a revision? What's that? You can say loud. OK, let's see. Our research aimed. Oh, I want to give him a round of applause. <laughs> Perfect. Our research aimed to assess how variable A affects DNA replication rates. It's stronger, right? It just you can tell where all the, the important parts are in that, in that sentence. To get back to you, we are looking back on what was done to figure out what we can do moving forward. This looks like an exercise in how to use prepositions annoyingly. How can we change it? Okay, use the bigger, the stronger verb. We are examining the past to determine how we should proceed. It's tighter, it uses far f fewer words and less prepositions as well. Uh, last, I want to look at nominalizations. These are very similar. Actually, we've seen some examples. This is a fancy word for um, using nouns that were formed from verbs. We want fewer nominalizations. It is clunky, and it takes up space. So as I said, a nominalization is what occurs when you change a verb into a noun and add a meaningless verb to it. What is meaningless? It's a verb that you see all the time that does nothing to help the main verb. Joe will conduct research on the impact of the recent drought on local wildlife. I'm sure we've all written these in our manuscripts several hundred times, conducting research. Why do we need conduct? It's meaningless. Joe will research the recent drought's impact on local wildlife. The board will make a decision next week about whether to accept, accept you next week. Uh, the board will decide next week whether to accept you, right? So make, make a decision. Decide is stronger. 
decision is nominalized. Decide is the verb from which it's nominalized. Use the verb instead. Um, here's another f way to change the nominalization. When the nominalization is the subject of a passive voice, identify the true subject and convert the nominalization to a verb. The approval of the plan was given by the committee yesterday. Much, much leaner and cleaner. The committee approved the plan yesterday. Uh, we see these. I wouldn't be giving you examples if, if these weren't very common uh, writing clunky, clunky style that we see when we edit manuscripts. Their interpretation of, the implementation of, already I'm lost, right? <laughs> if, a, if a journal reviewer is reading this, they probably don't want to finish reading it. Their interpretation of the implementation of the Institute's program was insightful. They insightfully interpreted how the Institute implemented its program. You can change insightful to an, an adverb and eliminate these ofs. First was their introduction of, their analysis of, dreams by the trauma patients. Hmm. Where's the action? Focus on the action. What did they do? First, they introduced how they analyzed the trauma patients' dreams. I think all of us can agree which, um, which one is easier to read of the two. Okay. Uh, I want to give you just a couple more examples and see if you can, see if you can work them out for yourself and maybe shout, shout out. Uh, how you think these should be re revised. They reached the conclusion that we should run a new cohort study. This one. What's that? All together. <laughs> yeah, good. So even though you, you, might, you know this when you're shown the structure and shown how to change it, uh, uh, when, when you're in the writing process, you might still have the habit of make a conclusion. So when you're editing is when you can really focus on uh, how you have these extra words, um, you can really change the style and the uh, grammar issues when you're editing. The undertaking of building the new company was complicated by their lack of experience. There's a few ways to do it, so I won't ask you to shout it, but they lacked experience, which complicated how they built the new company. Or their inexperience complicated how they built the new company. You have a straight uh, subject, verb, predicate. Okay, um, that is my presentation. I want, uh, um, today we've looked at a lot of ways at which authors can improve their manuscripts. And I really hope I've impressed upon you the importance of you as an author creating a polished manuscript. And if you're in the market for a reputable editing service who can, uh, after you're done self-editing, -ed can provide editing services, um, please check out our company, Wordvice. We have hundreds of well-qualified, experienced editors um, in various academic fields, and that includes academic editing is one of our services. We do have pamphlets in the back, somewhere back there, if you're interested, feel free to take one. Uh, thank you very much.